Um, my talk is about a uh, man in the middle attack uh, against this industrial control system here. Very simple industrial control system. Just got a controller and a PLC or a PLC controller, programmable logic controller, and an I/O block. Uh, but I actually got a chance to get down into the details of what what went on during the man in the middle attack itself um, to the actual control signals themselves. So I try and go into that a little bit more. Um, about me, of course. Uh, I'm a senior investigator at Conexus Consulting. Uh, I do industrial control system and SCADA system uh, assessments and designs for uh, a variety of customers, uh, anywhere from energy companies to oil and gas, to process control, to um, uh, manufacturing, and everything uh, pretty much between. Uh, I've been doing this for 20 plus years. Uh, I'm also uh, a developer on our analysis software internally. Uh, and um, I previously worked at NIST in the engineering lab where I did control systems, automated vehicles, uh, wireless sensors and systems. Uh, I'm now basically, uh, um, I've been a consultant now for three years. Uh, that was my midlife crisis, so. Um, this also shows, I'm also the uh, uh, co-chair of the ISA 99 committee, and if you know anything about industrial control system security, that's the, basically the committee that's developing all of the industrial control system cybersecurity standards uh, internationally. There's, NIST is doing some, and some other people are doing it, but we're trying to coordinate everything across the board. Um, so, when this shows up, man in the middle attacks are nothing new. I'm not going to run the coolest man in the middle attack here uh, because honestly, industrial control systems are the kind of things that you can look at wrong and they go down. The, um, in general, they're very fragile, they're very stable, so they work really well as long as you don't go near them, in general. Um, some of the newer systems and, and newer protocols are, are doing better, uh, but um, generally the systems are to be protected uh, like your most secure data. They, they've got to be uh, protected with layers of protection so that you don't get the standard kind of uh, things coming down in there, and a lot of times even protected to where you don't want your IT department coming down too. So the IT department a lot of times is uh, restricted from coming down into the system as well. There's a ton of videos and tutorials and all that kind of stuff oh, thank you. out there in the world for doing... Um, man the middle tax. So I'm not going to go into those. Uh, one of the best ones I actually found was from Iron Geek. Uh, he has a really good tutorial on um, doing man the middle attacks and writing filters uh, and everything in the mean uh, in between. So I would definitely highly recommend taking a look at his stuff uh, if you get a chance. Iron Geek, uh, Adrian Crenshaw, he does a lot of the, the videos and things like that, but he also really knows a hell of a lot about Ettercap and, and things like that. So um, this is not a talk about how to run a really cool man in the middle attack. It's how to do a man in the middle attack and see what happens to the control system when you do that. So I, the ICS and SCADA systems, they really rely on deterministic communications. And when you run into man in the middle attacks, the determinism of those systems can really get affected. And we actually wanted to see what would happen to the real-time communications when you get down into that point, uh, into the levels of actually having this man in the middle attack uh, and see what, what effect it had on the deterministic communications. Can you detect the man in the middle attack using simple tools? Or do you really need a big monster IDS system or something that's home built or something like that? We wanted to see what, what you could do and how easily you could find some of this stuff. So what do I have? 
in this box, I have a controller. So this is the, this is the controller, the PLC here, programmable logic controller. I've got an I.O. block right here that uh, controls these buttons. So you hit the button, the light, blunk, uh, the light turns on. The light on these is independently controlled from the button push. So the button push sends a signal to the PLC. The PLC says, turn on the light. So it sends a signal back to turn on the light. Uh, so you can actually do the man in the middle attack to actually adjust what happens with the lights in this box. Um, I'm basically, I ran uh, EdderCap in complete script kitty mode. I said, plug in, turn on. I'm not an EdderCap expert. I got a chance to play around with it because it was fun. Uh, but I really don't know enough. And talk to other people if you want to know how to do EdderCap better. Um, total script kitty with this. I captured traffic. Um, this is one of the Netgear switches. It has a mirror, uh, has a mirror port. Uh, and so we spanned the taps, or spanned the, the ports, and basically captured off the mirror port there. So we had at least a clean capture of all the traffic on the network. Um, the PLC to I.O. communications uses what's called Ethernet Industrial Protocol. This is not Ethernet IP as in TCP IP. Terrible name, but it was what it is. Uh, look it up. Um, I, go, I think I've got a little bit on that uh, later. Uh, we ran at 10 millisecond frequency, which is a fairly standard for uh, industrial control systems. Not too fast to where you're doing like really high speed control, uh, and you really get down to the point of actually looking at like how you can synchronize multiple devices, clocks, and everything like that. This is uh, general purpose manufacturing. Uh, auto manufacturers typically use 10 milliseconds. Uh, air, uh, uh, aircraft manufacturers like Boeing and, and your, uh, uh, Airbus, they typically run all their controllers at 10 milliseconds. So it's a fairly common uh, frequency to run. It's fast enough that we can get some good high quality, uh, high fidelity data too. Uh, and basically we were running a man in the middle tick against the PLC itself. So target one in EdderCap was the PLC uh, and not, we weren't running it against the IO block itself. Um, so a little bit about Ethernet IP. Uh, it was originally developed by a company called Rockwell Automation, Alan Bradley. Um, and uh, it's now managed by a group called ODVA. It's generally used at the lower levels, so you won't see Ethernet IP traffic up past sort of uh, the controller level. Generally, the controllers talk to something, to some sort of historian or uh, HMI system using another protocol. Uh, in, in Ethernet IP is typically between the PLC and the lower level devices down below. Uh, the uh, um, HMIs, the motors, the IO blocks, sensors, all that kind of stuff. Uh, ODVA, or Ethernet IP uses, uh, it's basically a common layer four and up protocol. It uses the TCP IP stack unmodified. So they've figured out how to actually do deterministic communications over standard TCP IP. Uh, some of the industrial protocols have actually gone and removed portions of the TCP stack as they've gone along uh, for different reasons. Um, some of them get down into doing synchronizations in the nanoseconds when you're actually like running newspaper mills and stuff like that, where they're actually running a mile long, 100 motors have to be synchronized at the few microseconds. So they, they found that they have to do it a different way uh, using specialized protocols. And they've actually removed even portions down to uh, removing like the 802 link layer stuff to where they run just literally over the 802 uh, phi level. So, uh, but Ethernet IP has done all, they've made a point of stating from the very beginning that they wanted to run everything over um, unmodified TCP IP. Uh, it uses both a command response type protocol, so kind of like your uh, uh, server client kind of stuff. So give me your data, here's my data. Give me your data, here's my data. Uh, and they also do a publish and subscribe, where uh, the devices kind of agree during their handshaking of how fast the data is going to come out. And then it, uh, the I.O. block, in this case, just says, here's my data, here's my data, here's my data, here's my data, here's my data. Here's my data. And the other guys say, OK, that's cool, I got it. And they just sort of. Uh, they use a handshake to basically make sure that the communication is still going on, but they don't go into anything of actually having to ask every single time for that piece of data. Um, 
If you look in Wireshark, uh, you'll find the protocol in there. It's uh, in Wireshark. It's ENIP is the uh, the four-digit or the four-letter kind of code for it. Uh, the command response uses TCP 44818, uh, and this does what's uh, it does two different types of messages. One's called unconnected. So this is the I want to start talking to you. I don't know who you are yet, so here's, here's a message to get that started. This is sort of the initial handshake process. Uh, then they have what's called connected messaging. That will actually use long-term TCP connections uh, and sending commands and responses over that uh, long-term, long-duration TCP connection uh, with some sort of periodic rates. But again, most of the time, it's, it's, uh, that would be a, uh, like some sort of HMI system uh, or um, uh, command response where someone is actually having to actually, a human is having to be in the operation typically. Uh, it wouldn't be the actual low level control stuff. The low level control is typically done uh, with publish and subscribe, and that uses UDP 2222. Um, it's considered real time messaging because it's, it's an implicit connection. They agree during their handshaking process of what the message is going to look like how often they're going to send, and then basically that initial communication handshaking goes away. So the initial TCP command stuff goes away, and then it's just a full UDP back and forth. If they don't hear a UDP message from those devices within a certain amount of time, they will actually close down the connection, uh, and then if it's programmed that way, it'll reestablish connection. Otherwise, it'll go into some error state. So. Um, and, and this is how pretty much most uh, of the real-time communication works. Uh, it can use either multi for the um, publisher. So in this case, the I.O. block itself that's publishing data, uh, it can use a multicast protocol or it can do UDCast. Uh, they, did an, they did multicast originally because they wanted to have the idea of having multiple devices be able to subscribe to that. Um, and this guy would only have to produce one packet to, that everyone would sort of listen into. So, um, what do I actually have here? Uh, I kind of went through this a little bit already. Um, PLC, I.O. block, uh, Netgear, um, I had the GS108E. So it's got, a, it's got the ability to do mirror port on it, um, and it's gigabit. Um, I ran uh, Man in the Middle. Man in the Middle machine was Kali Linux 2.0 VM. Uh, and I just used the default Kali version of Ettercap that was in there. So. Um, and then the capture machine was Kali Linux native uh, and whatever their native version of Wireshark. Typically, I actually recompile Wireshark myself just because it's a lot better that way. But uh, in this case, I just did a dumb, completely uh, new wipe of the system and, and just reloaded it by itself just to have a clean system that I didn't have to mess with or basically prove out. So uh, I did Ettercap uh, with target one being the PLC itself. That was the main target of the, P of the man in the middle attack. Uh, and target two was the IO block. Um, and basically, I just ran uh, ARP poisoning with, this, uh, with the sniff remote connections, just because it was a little bit easier to do that. Uh, since the networks are extremely small, things like the ICMP, uh, uh, I forget what the, uh, some of the other things, but basically it's like ICMP. There was no gateway I could go to like spoof out the gateway for these connections. So since this is so small uh, and this switch really wasn't doing a whole lot of layer three routing or anything like that, our poisoning was the only one that really made sense since it was all physically on the same switch. It wasn't having to trans transmit over uh, routes or anything. Um, and just to let you know, I actually did run all of this uh, stuff through uh, through VirusTotal, Network Miner, and Bro. Like all the actual stuff that I actually ran against this uh, system, I ran those through, and none of them detected the attacks or at least alerted like there was some really bad thing going on. It noticed some new traffic. It noticed some ICMP traffic that came through for the for the R poisoning itself. But that was it. There was nothing extra special that it really t uh, alerted on. So these are uh, pretty stealthy if you actually can go through them. Does Bro understand um, this? It, 
Uh, they are working on it. I know I've actually worked with Liam, and he actually wanted to try and play around with one of these boxes. Um, but he left DC before he could get a chance to do it. Um, so, but yeah, he, he wants to play around and, and actually learn more about Ethernet IP. I know that they do have something in there for it, but I don't know to what extent they've got stuff. So. Um, I did actually run a filtered attack just to see if I could actually adjust the data that was going on through here and, and turn lights on and off uh, without, um, without uh, the system really realizing what was going on. So inside the, because it uses UDP, um, it's a connection, it's connectionless. So what they do is they handle the connection oriented stuff at the upper levels, at the actual layer seven application layer. So they have in, embedded in the real time communication, they use a connection ID, a sequence number, uh, and then the data is a separate field. Um, so in order to actually spoof out the signals, what I did is I advanced the sequence number by five uh, to basically make my, my signal more relevant. And it actually basically said, OK, the PLC signal that was the, the sequence number minus five is old data, so that doesn't matter anymore. So it just said, screw it, you're, you're done. Um, and it took my man in the middle data as preferred data at that point. So ignore the sequence that you're yep, exactly. Um, and, and there's supposed to be some protocol stuff to handle that, where it's only allowed to handle one sequence number change at a time. Um, but I chose five in this case to make it obvious, but you can actually, I, I did it two where I just advanced it one sequence number, and that worked just as well. So. I only did it for five here just to make sure that it was actually noticeable in the data itself. Uh, and then what I did is I actually wanted to see what would happen to the data itself uh, if I adjusted things. So I adjusted the data signals for these buttons uh, coming. The commanded data, what I did is I, the command from the PLC to the I.O. block, I actually adjusted. I added four to that, which uh, you'll see at the end basically just shifts over which button it thinks is pushed. So um, it actually, it, it, when it thought it was open and not pushed, it actually looked like it was pushed from the PLC said, go ahead and light that light. So, uh, and, and I put this up here on the screen. I'm actually checking to find out. I have to check with my employer to find out if I'm allowed to release these. Since it is actually an attack against an industrial protocol, I don't know if I'm going to be legally allowed to do that, but, or if our lawyers will just throw a fit. At, so, um, I, and I've got to basically, I'll, I'll I'll find out and and let people know on Twitter if that that's going to happen. So, <laughs> um, so this is actually the series of tests that I ran. I ran one series with the multicast, which this is actually the more common way that an Ethernet IP is run. Uh, with multicast uh, publisher data. Uh, and I ran a baseline. I actually went through and, and did the button pushes just to see what the different data comes out as. Ran the middle attack uh, here. I did man the middle attack with the button pushes. Ran the filter and then reran with the, the button pushes. And then I ran the whole series again with uh, unicast data as well. So, uh, and this is another one of these things. I got to check with my employer whether uh, I'm allowed to post these capture files. I think the, the Wireshark captures I might be able to post. I'm not sure about the filter itself, but. It, it, I mean, this was, this is the filter here. It's like four lines, five lines of code. So, but I just got to check whether I'm allowed to post that up on the internet. Um, so here's the actual like detailed information. Uh, I had the MAC address uh, for the PLC, the IP address, MAC address, IP address. Um, the PLC to I/O block was running 10 milliseconds uh, cyclic frequency, uh, and this is a unicast connection here. So this is always saying, "I'm talking to you directly over unicast." Uh, and then the I/O block publisher of the data was using. Um, did both multicast. Uh, so the multicast was going out to this IP address at that 10 frequency. Um, unicast, of course, goes directly to it. And then that's the MAC address of my VMware man in the middle station. So 
when you actually get into looking at stuff. Um, here's just a, again, so for the baseline test, uh, this connection here was unicast, uh, and then this was either multicast or unicast, depending on the test that I was running. Um, and so let me explain a little bit about what this is. Uh, what you're actually looking at is the cyclic frequency of these signals. So this is actually 10 milliseconds right here. Uh, and what you see is between about 10 point, this is 10.4 here, and this is 9.8. So within uh, about 400 microseconds distribution, you get these signals all going um, basically a, at approximately 10 milliseconds. Every 10 milliseconds, you've got your spacing on, on what the data is. Uh, and then this is, the, this is the PLC communication to the I.O. block itself. A little bit wider distribution, but again, uh, this is 10, this is 10.4, 10.6. So again, you've got about maybe 500 microsecond distribution on here. Um, and so these are fairly deterministic. Uh, this is well within 10% of the mean uh, of the signal. So this is, this is pretty well deterministic on your signals. So now, what happens when you actually run the man in the middle attack? Um, and so for the multicast test, because this signal was multicast coming back, the man in the middle attack did not actually do it because it was going after IP address to IP address. And since this was actually going out over multicast, it never actually was affected by the uh, man in the middle attack itself. The only one that was was the signal between the PLC and the I.O. block. So when you actually look at it, you'll see two packets from the PLC, effectively from the PLC to the I.O. block. But when you actually start looking at the Ethernet packet here, um, like in this particular packet, this one went from the PLC to the VMware station. The next one, of course, went from the VL, v, uh, VMware station to the I.O. block itself. Um, and then, as I show here down here, here's the sequence number and the data. Um, from this, I was not running the filter at this time. I've got another one later that actually shows the filter. But you can actually see in the sequence numbers. Uh, and then, again, in, in the uh, Ethernet IP like version here, you've got a connection ID and the sequence number. And so you can actually watch it moving up as you go along. So. With the multicast test, basically, there's no difference between what the PLC is sending out and what the I.O. block is sending out. They don't even notice that a man on the middle attack is going on at all. They're pretty dumb with this. They don't even know anything's going on. But then, what happens when you actually look at, so this is looking at just the IP address of the, um, the PLC to the IP address of the I.O. block. And then, so obviously, this is where I was running the man in the middle attack here. Um, this is actually combined. It's seen both those sets of packets. So looking back at this, it's actually doing, uh, it's actually just analyzing both these sets of packets in here. So this isn't really what you want to look at. This is what you want to look at. So this is what the actual, um, I.O. block is seeing that's directed at its MAC. So here, you've got the PLC signal. And then you actually launch the man in the middle attack. And you notice the man in the middle attack itself doesn't, OK, so it doesn't affect the mean of the signal at all. But there is a noticeable difference in the distribution of the attack from the PLC to the I.O. block where this actual man in the middle attack was going on. Uh, but again, most of these devices, they take averages. So as long as the average number of packets remains the same, they don't actually record anything about the, um, they don't record anything about the, uh, the packet distributions or anything like that internally. This is the kind of stuff you can measure yourself, though. You can go in and just run Wireshark captures, take Wireshark, um, and export to whatever you want. Uh, the, I actually did a, This is using my specialized analysis software, but you can take and throw this into a CSV file and plot it in Excel if you want. 
This is actually not that hard to do in Excel. Uh, basically, you isolate the you isolate the stream you want, and then it comes out as a nice straight long number. You can post the data and actually figure out what the communications is on this. All this is is just literally the time during the test over the time between subsequent packets. So it's a delta time versus time. So it's not that hard to do. I've got actually a little bit more information on that from a talk I did at B-Sides DC last month, I think it was. So if you want that, and it's, it's not that hard to do. So now, running unicast, the man in the middle attack actually did do the reverse communications. And now you get something very similar. So in here, you've got now two packets going for each one uh, that you initially had uh, from, the, from the devices. And again, the PLC itself and the IO block itself didn't care one way or the other that the man in the middle attack was going on. They actually didn't adjust their timing at all. But then, like the first time, this is actually what it looks like just doing the IP address. And in this particular case, the herringbone patterns, from what I've seen a lot of times, has to do with clock skew between the two different devices. The man in the middle, the man in the middle PC was just a slightly clock skewed, so it, it drifted differently than the uh, device. So that's where you get these weird patterns in here. But again, this isn't really what you want to look at. This is what you want to look at. And so this is actually uh, looking at the man in the middle attack here. Uh, this is the, the standard PLC to I.O. block communications, or this is actually, sorry, this is the I.O. block coming out. And again, the mean remains the same, so in general, you actually wouldn't, no statistics would happen in this system that would tell you anything was going on. This is the kind of thing that you can capture yourself on a monitor port uh, and do some form of, uh, of analysis, NSM basically, with very cheap tools, a laptop, Wireshark, and Excel. You can do this stuff yourself. So this is something that's essentially a level one analyst would know. And then he'd escalate it to yes. level two. Yes. Yes. Exactly. And that the kind of thing that uh, this is what you would do periodically testing. So um, this is a huge amount of data to try and go through in real time. Um, but it's the kind of thing that if you had to do a periodic yearly annual assessment, you go through. You go to each, you go to different places around your network, you capture the traffic, and you spend a week or two analyzing it, coming up with a signature of what your system has in it to begin with. And uh, during your factory acceptance testing, your site acceptance testing, your commissioning, basically all during that time where you can get clean, gold standard versions of what should be on your systems at any one time. And then you can come back and start comparing them and look for these different signatures of Oh, something is different than what it used to be. Hmm, maybe I should go and investigate. And then, it, then you go in and do second tier, third tier analysis of what's going on. But just looking at what happened now versus what happened before, you can really get a lot of information out of your systems. So. Um, now, I did actually run the filter just to see what would happen. Uh, and I can show you this downstairs, too, a little bit more. Um, but... Uh, so we, we really weren't looking to see what effect. Filter really wasn't very difficult. As you saw, it was a few lines of code. It really didn't do very much. But it was something to see if the filter actually had any effect on the performance data. Did, did running a filter here on this actually move these lines at all because of the additional processing that had to go on in the man-in-the-middle attack itself? Well. Basically, we did, the, we did everything here, and it actually didn't affect the performance at all. It was pretty much the same thing. Uh, what I did, um, just to lay it out here, so I actually went through and, and ran a whole series of tests to one, went through the whole process. I only put in a few of the buttons here, but I've got the full set of like two of them, and then three of them, and did a whole series of that kind of stuff that I've got recorded. Uh, and basically, what, what you can see here is that this is the signal that was originally here, and all it did is just add four to the data. Effectively, what that did is that shifted the bit pattern over, so one of the buttons acted opposite of the way it should. So um, I think in this case, it was this second button that was, uh, that was uh, basically bit number four. It would turn off when it was supposed to turn on, and it was on when it was supposed to be off. So 
pretty simple. Instead of, it was basically on now, and then it would shut off when I would hit the button. But effectively, it showed that you could actually do this with relatively simple kinds of things. And as I said, I, I learned how to use EdderCap in about like half an hour uh, and found Iron Geek's tutorial and wrote a filter in about another half an hour and ran a man in the middle attack. So it's not that hard to do, especially against industrial control systems that, I mean, the stuff exists in Wireshark. You can go and figure it out and then adjust what you need to do. Um, and then here you can actually see, so, <coughs> uh, I don't know, where is it? So this, this packet right here, these two, uh, this was 2542, uh, it became 2547, and then also the data in this particular case was 40 and it became 44. So that's all I did. Uh, by advancing the sequence number, I basically took control by, by being newer than the, than the previous data, so it disregarded what was going on. Um, the captures, as I said, I'm going to try and probably uh, post them up on our GitHub, uh, but I got to check with my employer first. Uh, I will post stuff out to Twitter after I find out yes or no whether I can do that or not. Uh, and this is my contact information. So uh, Jim Gilson is my Twitter. And uh, so that's it. Are there any questions? Yeah. Extremely. So yeah, the, the guys that actually did Stuxnet, not that people know who did that or anything, <laughs> they had very detailed information about exactly the systems, exactly the data that was being contained in there. Uh, and, and they didn't actually run a man-in-the-middle attack against this communications. They ran it against the engineering workstation, which programmed this. And so they, they adjusted the engineering workstation to actually cause even worse things. I just did one simple thing, but they actually added a lot of extra math to go in and actually like vibrate it more uh, and, and do some really nasty stuff to it. So. But they had very detailed information about the very specific protocols and uh, data sets and everything to go along with that. Yes, actually Ethernet IP is in the process of actually building in security to their system. Since they use a default TCP IP stack, they're actually putting in SSL, TLS, uh, and certificates, and the whole deal. Uh, some of the other protocols, uh, DMP3 has, uh, has actual uh, security built into its connection, um, but there are very few that have security. These systems were never designed with security in mind. They were designed to get a job done. Ethernet IP as a protocol was written in, it was published by ODVA in 2001. It was uh, built by Rockwell before that uh, in the late 90s. But again, it was actually based on a protocol that was written for thick net pipe uh, inside a plant that you couldn't physically get onto because you didn't have the, uh, the actual connection to tap into it. So the protocol was based on really old stuff, uh, field bus technology that was never designed to have security built in. Very really little closed stuff, where literally if you, if you didn't have your terminators screwed in tight enough, you would throw the whole system off. So, so this is a massive chip. Absolutely. Some protocols are, um, other protocols are not. So things like uh, Profinet, which is a European standard, they've basically decided that <coughs> um, they don't need security because they're now literally getting rid of parts of the TCP IP stack. And when you get down into the real time, 
what they call uh, industrial real time, uh, where they're literally synchronizing motors uh, at microseconds. If things aren't plugged in just right, you're going to throw the whole system off. So again, they're getting down into where they basically modeled a field bus over uh, STP cables. Well, okay, so this test, uh, this particular test was around 70 seconds of data, and this was 7,000 points. So, I mean, not, not a huge amount, but the capture files are all ready just for that 60 seconds, and this is one device talking to one other device. That's not when you actually consider a full plant. When you start considering a full plant, then you're getting into gigabytes of data per day that you have to go through and analyze, and analyze really down deep. It, not really, because most of the time, the real-time traffic does not leave the local switch. So the real-time traffic, uh, in, in a lot of these cases, they're very um, cell-oriented. So this PLC will talk to this I.O. block and this screen, this HMI, all plugged into the same switch. And unless there's some specific amount of information that needs to go out of that switch, nothing ever leaves that switch. You need to tap into it. And that's where things like industrial IDS systems, they've tried to like really push them down lower into the architecture. But the problem is you're now talking having to throw a 1500 to $3,000 box at every single work cell just to do analysis. And then you've got to build out the infrastructure to talk from those guys to some sort of supervisory IDS. And you really get into problems. Yes. And if you're dealing with uh, medical systems, food and drug, uh, any change to the system at all requires recertification of the entire line. So not just recertification of this one cell. You've now got to recertify an entire 50 to 100 work cell line for simply doing AV updates. So companies don't want to do that. How do they do security today? Huge levels of isolation and segregation, generally. They basically disconnect it as much as possible and don't touch it. If they're getting to that point of where they're doing nuclear regulatory certification or um, uh, food and drug certification, things like that, most of the times those systems are install it and forklift upgrade it in 25 years. So that's... Because those systems are meant to go like yes. 25, 30, 40 years. Yes. Yeah, literally, like their downtimes, their, their uptime downtime is in seven nines reliability. They, they just don't shut down. So. Again, syslog will give you averages. It won't give you the detailed fingerprinting kind of stuff that you, that you really need to determine what's going on. Yeah, averages will give you some things. And you can tell, oh, yeah, all of a sudden we're getting a DDoS from something over here. But I can tell you, most of the time when you're getting DDoS stuff in the industrial world, it's because the NIC card on the HMI went down, and not because you're getting a real, actual, external DDoS attack. Or the guy with the forklift ran over the power wire or network cable. Or the fiber that was hanging across here all of a sudden started to go down, uh, got hit by the guy running the stuff across the way. Or you turned on a motor on the other side of the plant and the EMI translated over the wire and now you've got a, now you've got a problem with that. So. so it's not necessarily an external attacker. It's more likely human error or mechanical Yeah, 99. Whenever we've run into things, <clears throat> I've only run into one active malware uh, inst at, whenever I did an assessment. 
and even that malware was questionable. It, was, it showed up as an attack in VirusTotal and a couple other places, but when you really looked at it, it, it looked like it was actually an, an old industrial device that was using a proprietary protocol and doing something it wasn't supposed to do. But we couldn't verify that, so we had to at least flag it as malware. So. Of course. There is stuff out there. Um, the companies that I have gone into and assessed, that's not the problems that they have. So, um, and, and, and if you look at Havex, Havex was not, an, that was nothing to do with the industrial control system itself. That was a rat on the vendor site. So they went and basically did a, a rogue version of the firmware for devices on the, on the actual uh, vendor site. And so when people downloaded a new version, they downloaded the, firm, the, the virus from there. It wasn't actually an attack on the industrial control system itself. Yeah, again, it's one of these that it exists, it's out there, people found it, um, but you would, yeah. The likelihood of actually seeing that on a system you're assessing is extremely rare because of the, simply the fact that these systems don't change. And if they do, somebody did something they're not supposed to do. Um, it's actually a lot easier because you can go through and fingerprint your systems. You can actually load whitelisting on a system in an industrial control system and get really good results at it. Because those systems, even the HMI systems and the, the controllers and all this kind of stuff that are PC based, they don't change but once a year, typically. So you only have to redo that whitelist once every year instead of every time Microsoft decides to ship out an update or every time there's an Adobe failure or things like that. So, so whitelisting actually works really well for PC-based systems. These systems here, um, typically they don't even bother to try and fix it and determine what really went on forensically on here. They will just say, I need to get this system back up and running now. I have this copy of my program that was running on here and this firmware. I'm going to load it because it'll take me 10 minutes to do that, whereas it would take me days to rip this out and put a new one in and forensically analyze what's going on in here and all this kind of stuff. So it's mostly about dollars of getting production back online. So, so as I said, um, I will be, I have three of these systems with me. I actually put them on the table downstairs just before lunch. If you want to, uh, feel free to play around with it. Uh, I've got port one set up on each one of these switches as a mirror port, so you can go and, and see what's on there. Um, I would ask you, uh, don't be a dick and reprogram my devices. Um, I can, I have the programs with me to fix them, but I would basically just ask you not to. Yeah, exactly. So, thank you. <laughs>